and individuals in our lives that have made such a difference to ourselves, our families, and our community, human nature says we take them for granted as well. And in the course of time, there's an element of injustice that a great many individuals who made substantial contributions to people's lives on a small level, on a national level sometimes, and even on an international level, are forgotten. It's always an honor to introduce a good historian. It's a special honor when you get to introduce a friend. Dominic Lietze is a native son of Albany. He went to Cardinal McCluskey Memorial High School, now known as McGinn. He went to Siena College, something that uh, he and I both share in our biographies. On to the State University, he studied at Cornell, and he dedica dedicated himself to education. Moved over into Columbia County and taught for a number of years there with distinction and always noticed that the Martin Glynn Elementary School was in Valatia. And it was so named, and very appropriately so, because there was a favorite son of Valatia, somebody who got uh, caught up in uh, the difficult years before World War I, and along the line, his memory faded. And so he did a study, and if you can look at his book, You'll see he did an exhaustive study. He did oral histories for the few survivors that were left. He looked at official records. He dug deeper and deeper into the history of who is this Martin Glenn, after whom the local elementary school was named in the town where his parents raised him and his family. His parents, Irish family immigrants, uh, part of the American dream, produ produced this extraordinary man who came from ordinary surroundings and always remembered his roots as he served in public life. So I'm going to uh, stop there and say it's a great honor and a privilege and a joy to introduce Dominic Lietze. Thank you, sir. Thank you for restoring our heritage to us. I'm honored to be here, sincerely, and thank you, Mr. Cleary, for inviting me as well. You, organizations like this are so important to the future as well as the past, in my opinion, because as the melting pot rightly so bubbles with different seasonings and different spices, to keep what you have to pass it on because we are now in the future, and not too many of us are going to be Italian Americans or Polish Americans or Czechoslovakian Americans or Irish Americans. We're going to be European Americans. And I think that's the way sociologists are pushing uh, the thought, which is probably, which is definitely correct. There's no question about it. For the future to know what your and my ancestors went through, not only in the old country, but here, so that they can be where they're at, is important. You don't know who you are unless you know where you've been, in my opinion. It's interesting, this Glenn guy. I went down to Appalachia and I titled the book, Governor Martin H. Glenn, Forgotten Hero. And let me make an aside here before I go any further. I left my speech up here. I never do that because I gave a speech once at 800 people and I had it all laid out and I'm around shaking hands and all of a sudden, all of a sudden it was that school teacher thing matched me. And all of a sudden this little old school teacher, probably an elementary teacher, comes up and she's going through the papers. All of a sudden I look and she's walking down with my speech. <laughs> oh my God, I tackled her. Love it, right? But anyway, I titled the book Governor Martin H. Glenn, Forgotten Hero. And when I became village historian, which I served up until recently, for about 15 years, the first thing I said, I've got to find out who this Glenn guy is. I said, 
Nobody knows anything about him. His name is there. You know, uh, I asked people, uh, particularly the elderly people, and uh, they didn't know too much about him. And uh, they didn't want to say, oh, good family. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. Nobody, and they, their eyes would kind of just look, you know, look away. And some, I said, that's really interesting. A small town of 1,400 people. You got a governor. Yeah. Not as fancy as Kinderhook down down the road, which has a president, but you know, they are what they are, we are what we are, and all that, you know. So I said, I got to find out. So I did some preliminary research, and the first thing, one of the first things I found out was this tomb, mausoleum, was in St. Angus Cemetery, where all our family, most of our family, are buried in Shuba, right? From all the Catholics. So I said, let's go check. I get my wife, Marianne, we got our two daughters. We find out where it is. I go up to the top of the hill, and that's where I started the book. And I'd like to read you the prologue. Section 35 of St. Agnes Cemetery sits on a hillside above the Hudson River, just across from Troy, New York. St. Agnes is the main cemetery for the Roman Catholic Diocese of Albany. Palm Sunday, 1992 was cold, and the winds came up from the river. <clears throat> the sky was deep, deep gray, as was Troy across the river. <clears throat> A road winds up the hill, both sides of it neatly marked by stones witnessing the past lives. Near the top of the hill, the gravestones stop, and impressive mausoleums rise like miniature mansions. They sit there, commanding a view of the other dead. These are the tombs of those who made it in America, rich sons of the immigrant masses. Most of their names are <coughs> Irish. This fact marks not only their success in the economic and political life of Albany, New York, but also of the workings of the church. This day, Little sun reflected off the time-worn mausoleums, and the cold wind just added to the bleakness. The stone tombs were neat and well-tended, except for one. This one, behind a massive growth of trees and brush, was barely visible from the road. It was the tomb of Martin H. Glynn, long forgotten, first Roman Catholic governor of New York. The iron gate of the gray granite tomb was locked. The upper right tier held the body of Governor Martin H. Glenn. Inside, on other tiers, were the remains of his wife, Mary McGrain Glenn, 1880-1948, and infant Ruth T., 1906, their only child. This mausoleum held secrets and tragedies like all graves. Hopes broken, hope broken dreams, and deep suffering were buried here. The most obvious was Ruth, the Glenn's only child, who lived but two months and 12 days and died of pneumonia on February 9, 1906. This forgotten governor was a man of dreams, a poor man who became rich, a man of small stature who became a giant, he, in his short life of 53 years, 1871 to 1924, was a successful journalist, an editor, publisher, lawyer, congressman, state controller, lieutenant governor, diplomat, and renowned orator. But now he was forgotten. Lynn was one of the bright stars of the progressive movement that helped America become a more decent society. He worked for two decades with Woodrow Wilson, Theodore Roosevelt, William Jennings Bryan, and William Randolph Hearst, as well as the power brokers of Albany and the Tammany Machine. He lit the sky of the American progressive politics with his oratory, brilliant intelligence, humanism, and wit. But suddenly he was gone. <coughs> Only little children in his mid-Hudson Valley home, town, hometown, excuse me, seemed to know his name as they walked to the Glynn Elementary School on Church Street in Galatia, New York. 
that triggered again, even further in my mind, how come nobody knows him? Why is this thing is what it is? All brush, we had literally, my youngest daughter and I, crawl under the brush from, I would say, from here to that you know, wall, which was about 15 feet, to get to it. So I said, here's this beautiful one. So I go back home and I talk to the village people. I was involved in village government at the time. For many years, I had been. And bingo, they call, they call up uh, the Relations Citizens Action Committee or community or whatever you want to, corporation, whatever you want to call it at the time. Well, and uh, they got a hold of the St. Agus Cemetery people, and within 48 hours, the grave was cleaned up. And I got to give them credit for that. And under the new administration, the mausoleum is very well kept. Very well kept. So that says, how strange. So I looked into his basic record. He was a congressman in 1899 from Albany. He was a state controller in 1907, the lieutenant governor in 1913, first Roman Catholic governor in 1913, keynote speaker for the Democratic Convention for Woodrow Wilson, 1916. He helped establish a nation. Ireland, in 1921. Why doesn't anybody know it? How come? Even general histories of all of the area. Look, he was barely, he was not even, barely much in if mentioned at all. So I said, let's look at his life. So that is the first part of this presentation is why he's a hero. Okay. First of all, his parents, Martin Glenn Sr., came from Clare in Ireland, and his mother, Anne Scanlon, Scanlon came from County Mayo. And after the famine, as you people well know better than I do, the migration came to America. They came to New York City. They worked their way up the Hudson doing farm labor. And they worked on, Mr. Glenn worked on the railroads. And finally, they came to a place called Valencia, which had six large textile mills. <coughs> now, usually you think of factory towns, like, uh, for example, uh, uh, Pittsburgh, right? As big cities. But up and down the Hudson Valley were these major uh, little villages that were built around the production uh, of, uh, of factory materials, mainly uh, cap cut cloth for clothing, cohos being the largest in the world at one time, if I'm not mistaken. Now, Mr. Glenn Sr., after working on a railroad outside of Valencia, buys a pub on Main Street, which is still there, by the way, in the late 1860s. I was told by the first time I gave this presentation, some Irish American yelled out, he fulfilled every, Ir every Irishman's dream. <laughs> uh, that's a good line. I'm going to keep it in the air. <laughs> the Glenn family is a typical family of its time. Uh, it was about five, five children. They all worked in the bar. Okay? In this pub culture, which you people, I'm sure, understand much better than I do, formed him. The whole British Isles is known as having a pub culture where the center life of community activities and uh, community activities and uh, family life and the whole rising and falling of life is celebrated and mourned in, with, and around a pub. Okay? He worked in the pub with his family, so everything. But it formed him. It was one of the form great formation factors of his life. His ethnicity, for, for example. It became an Irish pub. So the Irish mill workers frequented Mr. Glenn's Sr.'s pub. Basic, right? The, the Scots Irishmen were up the street, literally, which that building I think is still there too, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, there was that kind of thing. You know, ethnics, as we all are, to a certain degree or not, like to be with their own. Nothing wrong with that. Okay? But his ethnicity was enforced. He saw the workers' plight in the mill, too, from the mills, in the bar. He saw they worked 13 hours a day. He saw they worked six days a week. He saw when the ice clogged the creek, they were unemployed, and they didn't get paid. When the cotton didn't come up from the south, they were unemployed. 
and they didn't get paid. When the market dipped and people weren't buying cotton cloth, they didn't get paid. They were out of work. And he saw the plight of the working man, which further identified himself with his roots and his culture. He saw when they were hurt and maimed in the mill accidents. He saw child labor. He himself started very young as a bookkeeper because he had a brilliant mind in the mills when he was an office boy. He saw the actual people being hurt and dying in these mills. He became a progressive Democrat. Because America at the time had many, many ills, as we all know. William Jennings Bryan became his hero. His uncle, or one of his relatives, I should say, I think by baptism, was uh, James Purcell. And he was known as the whole thing in Columbia. And he ran the whole Democratic Party in Columbia County. Fellow Irishman, right? He had a work ethic. He developed a work ethic there. He learned to deal with the public, to talk to people, right? And he learned business. It formed him. And he never forgot his roots. Never. He always identified with the village of Galatia. He uh, told people he was there. He, he, he came there often to visit family. His younger brother became a postmaster. His father was the postmaster. One of his uh, brothers became the mayor. He, and he always kept contact with his hometown. He was so at ease with people that he could deal with a president or a prime minister or an ambassador and be totally relaxed and go into the kitchen and be totally relaxed with the help. To me, that's a great man who can make that span. And how he did it, besides the education God was he never forgot where he came from. Other factors formed him. Millville itself, Galatia itself. It was called Millville in the early years. Uh, it was about 1,200 people at the time. Everything you could literally live and die in that whole village without leaving it have all your needs fulfilled. From birth to death. Everything was there. And it was typical small town America. It's a Mark Twain, was a Mark Twain kind of place. The boys fished in the creek. They skinny bit, bathed in the creek. Swam, right? They played baseball. And Glenn got hurt playing baseball. He got hurt sliding in the second. So the oral tradition goes on, hurt his back. Everything was there. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody had their own friends, but everybody was willing to help everybody. It was what a small town was all about in those days. And it formed him. The school formed him. It was at the time probably had the best school in Columbia County. He was a brilliant student and had a big library in the school, which amazed him right to his days of his death. They would find him in his chair in the Times Union with books piled up all around him. He started reading, reading history particularly, and he couldn't stop. He just devoured books. He'd read two or three at a time. The third thing that formed him was the church. It was an Irish Catholic church. If you go through the early parts of the cemetery, you can go through the cemetery, and you can see the graves with Irish names, and they tell you, actually tell you what county they're from as well, which I thought that was really interesting, how they kept their county distinction. It must have been very important. It was an Irish Catholic church. Father Griffith realized this boy was a genius. That he had something beyond the normal. Right? Even though he did steal pies from the windowsill of the parish house. <laughs> he got caught. He couldn't sing in the choir because he had a terrible voice. You know, but the priest said, this boy's got to go someplace. So with the priest's directions and connections, I'm sure Glenn, upon graduating, went to Fordham University, down to the big city. And this was a big deal. A, you know, a little country boy, all of a sudden, you're in New York City. Man, I lived in Prague, okay, which is a real major city. I visited, my wife and I, we visited Vienna, we visited Rome, we've been, you know, uh, all over Europe. We've lived in Europe for two years. I get overwhelmed by New York City myself, even to this day. 
it's, you know, I can't imagine these people from upstate New York how it uh, affected him. So he had the city influence there. He saw many different cultures for the first time. He saw many different kinds of people. He really hit the jackpot because the Jesuits were uh, ran the school, and they, they were the Jesuits were the premium uh, intelligentsia of the church. Fordham was the citadel. This is before Notre Dame became Notre Dame. Fordham was the school if you wanted a Catholic education, a classic education. He excelled. He won eight out of the ten gold medals. In my understanding, they were really gold medals upon graduation, and he was, became valedictorian of the class. It also exposed him to culture, plays, music. But the women's movement is absolutely right because something else affected him, influenced him as well as affecting him. On the train back and forth from, from New York City to Albany, he met the Farrell brothers. That would be Joseph and John. So who are the Farrell brothers? Now here's a family, another family that's been forgotten. John Farrell ran the Times Union. And he was a Democrat as well. His sons were known as the Young Turks in the only Democratic Party. But John was a good, solid Democrat. He got to like Glenn. And the old boy network hooked in. And Glenn made a lifelong friendship that got him into the newspaper business that got him into politics. So this old boy network is very, very, very important in form. They loved him. Upon graduation, he got a job in 1894 at the Hudson Star in uh, Columbia County as the business manager, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, quickly, the Times Union by John Farrell hired him, and he, and he served in the Times Union from 1895 to 1924. He rose from being a reporter to being an editor, to being a publisher and owner. You're looking at a Horatio Alger story. Remember the story of Horatio Alger? Everybody used to read it. You know, Horatio Alger was a series of novels in the early 1900s where a little, where a little boy started out, for example, uh, shining shoes outside the factory, and he made friends with the boss coming in, and the workers liked him, everybody liked him. He eventually got a job in the factory, and eventually he worked his way up to owning the factory. It was the American dream. And his story is very similar, starting from roots like that. He got exposed to city government. He got exposed to state government. And he got exposed later on to county government. He got all involved with all these things, just doing his beat, covering the news, right? And it fascinated him. Again, people started influencing him. Two men influenced his life. Patrick Packy McCabe, who was the clerk of the Senate, he was a Democrat, and he ran a Democratic Party in the city and in the county. Okay? Uh, Dan O'Connell once said, Packy could write, I'm going to paraphrase here, Packy could write a great letter, but couldn't get anybody elected. Well, that's not quite true, because he got Glenn elected. The other, and we'll see that in a minute, the other person that affected him was William Billy Barnes. He was the Republican boss of Albany. Now, my God, he ran the whole Republican Party in Albany. He was very influential on the state level and on a national level. And it just boggles my mind <laughs> to think that Albany was a Republican city. <laughs> it just boggles my mind. But it was. It was from 1891 to 1921, and he ran a tight ship. Now, the way I understand it, and I'm not an expert in Albany politics, he took the wasp base of the city and he tied it with, uh, I'm sure, the Civil War vets and waving the bloody flag, I'm sure, okay? And then he tied it in with German immigrants, German immigration. The Germans coming in. Whether they were Protestant or Catholic. I think that was his power base. Besides the wasp base with all the stores and the banks and all that. He was a wasp. He was rich from a rich background, very conservative, and he ran the journal, which was the rival newspaper of the Times Union. 
Now you got a classic struggle here. You got Martin H. Glenn, who was Irish, who was poor, who was progressive, and had the other newspaper, the Times Union. Now I think we should pause here. You got Glenn. You got books on the O'Connells. You got books on Corning. Right? Seems to me, 1891, 1921, that somebody who's retired <laughs> and interested in local history, <laughs> who has a great background in government and politics. Here's Martin Glenn Fiedemann, man. He became the youngest congressman in 1898 of, the, of that session. His main drive that he got done was he had the Hudson River surveyed from New York City up to Albany, because his desire was to turn Albany into a major seaport. And the concept behind it was that it would hook to the railroad system and canals going west. And upon his death, or close to his death, that all just about happened. It did happen. But that was his major thing. He ran for re-election. Barnes was ready for him this time. Knocked him off. Beat him. <laughs> so he goes back to the Times Union. Now this is a pattern. You go out and do public service, then you go back to your base. You go do public service, you go back to your base. In 1891, uh, President McKinley has him appointed to the St. Louis World Fair as a national commissioner. And there, he brought all his classical education from the Jesuits with him, and he made sure the history of New York State was well represented. And this is the famous St. Louis, I'll uh, meet you at the fair, uh, St. Louis, everybody loves that movie. Uh, and he met, that opened him up to the Midwest, right? and it opened him up to national leaders and a whole bunch of other people. And he was a national commissioner. He showed leadership skills, as well as his savvy of business in this kind of situation. Okay, so then the fair is over. In 1907, McCabe, Mc, 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 gets him nominated as state controller. What he did, I think, I couldn't prove this exactly, but I think he united the upstate Irish organizations, like in Syracuse and in Buffalo, across upstate New York to push that he gets the nomination. He ran with William Randolph Hearst, who was a wide-eyed liberal at the time, who later became very conservative. Hearst lost the election. Tammany Hall changed his mind midstream and didn't turn the vote out in New York City. There's ways of winning elections, right? When you're in the election, you turn the vote out. The other one, the influence election, you don't turn the vote out. <laughs> so uh, you're going to find this Tammany Hall where they were tough guys and they knew what they were doing. So Glenn Hearst lost as governor. Glenn won as state controller. And he led the ticket. He got more votes than the other candidates on the ticket. Okay. So what did he do as uh, state controller? And he was a brilliant businessman. He was a gigantic financial crisis. He saved the state millions of dollars. And he established a scrutiny of local governments, which is very, very important. These lo local governments practically was doing what they want with the people's money, I think. And he said, this has got to stop. We're going to make it accountability. Accountable, right? Again, he ran. Again, he lost. He lost. And he returned to the Times Union. Wow. So I said, my God, how can, I mean, here he's got two major offices. What's going on? Nobody knows him, not even for these things, you know? Anyway, election of 1912 comes up for governorship. Let's look at the Northern Democratic Party. The Southern Democratic Party, we know, was at that time run by the old Confederates and their, their descendants. The Northern Democratic Party had basically, from my reading, been taken over by the Irish. They had taken over Boston, okay. and Glenn was friendly with John F. Kennedy's 
grandfather, Honey Fitz, I think they call them, right? Honey Fitz, right? They had taken over Chicago, they had taken over Buffalo, they had taken over Baltimore. The Irish were coming into their own, establishing themselves, and politics were their gift. Right? They knew how to do it. Philadelphia, all these big city organizations, but it was not just in the big cities. In little villages where there were Irish communities, they took them over too. So they were really becoming the strength of the Democratic Party of, of the North. The big one, the Colossus, the monster as it was sometimes called, was Tammany Hall. It was a major Democratic power that controlled New York City and New York State politics. Its leader, was Charles Francis Murphy, the Tiger of Tammany. Smart, tough, shrewd. He was the boss's boss. He was the epitome. Now, McKay, forming with the upstate Democrats, Murphy, controlling New York City, formed an alliance. And the alliance led to victory for the Democrats that year in 1912. Tammany Hall nominated Governor William Saltzer, or excuse me, Congressman Saltzer, who became governor. And McKay got lieutenant, the lieutenant governorship to Martin H. Glenn. Wow. You got a balanced ticket here. You got a downstate guy, you got an upstate guy. Saltzer was Jewish, Lane was Catholic, he got the balanced ticket. Wow, interesting. Glenn outpolls Saltzer in his victory, 20,000 votes more approximately. He outpolled the head of the ticket. He was doing good, the man was rising like a rocket. So Saltzer, who had always been a creature of Tammany Hall, he was a progressive, don't get me wrong, but he was a creature. He didn't run and win in New York City without knowing what, without Tammany Hall's bag. All right? He was a creature. After he got elected, this guy had good school, right? He, he broke over with Tammany Hall over patronage. He said, no, I'm going to point who I want. I'm not going to point who you guys want. I'm going to point who's good for the people. I'm going to point who's good for me. And loyal to me, not as good to you, Mr. Murphy. The other thing I think part of it too was the uh, direct election, uh, excuse me, primary elections, primaries. Then the Democratic Party they hadn't quite figured out yet how to handle primaries, so they didn't have primaries. Everything done was done by caucuses. Well, amazingly, he broke publicly, the way I understand it, with Saltzer. Saltzer broke publicly with Murphy. And there was a meeting at the famous restaurant Delmonico's in New York City, which there used to be an exhibit, I believe, in the, in the State Museum. And Seltzer basically said to, to Murphy, I am the governor. And Murphy said, I'll have you removed. <laughs> well, he did. And New York State ran into its biggest constitutional crisis. He's Murphy controlled the state legislature. Al Smith, Robert Wagner, all good credentialed progressives, they knew who the boss was. They said, get him, Saltzer, and they got him. What did they get him on? Well, they impeached and removed Saltzer on the use of public financing for his campaign for personal use. Which way I understand it was a very common practice, but technically it was against the law. And they did get up. On October 17, 1913, Martin H. Glenn, Lieutenant Governor from the city of Albany, originally from Galatia, became the first Roman Catholic governor. Right? It was a nasty business. At the time there were two governors. Salzer wouldn't give it up. <laughs> Now what 
does Glenn do? And this is a very difficult thing when you're dealing with this kind of situation because it's so volatile. What do you do? How did he handle himself? If he backed Murphy, he would be, be he would be supporting a political machine, which the progressive wing of the Democratic Party and he himself did not really like. Okay? If he backed Sultan, and also if he backed Murphy, he would be look like he was trying to knock Sultzer off so he could become governor, a power grab, a coup d'etat. If he backed, if he backed Murphy, he would look like he was a power grid. If he backed Seltzer, Tammany Hall would have done that. So what did he do? The horns of the dilemma. In, in Thomistic philosophy, you have two, 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 uh, two horns. You position A, position B. What did the Jesuits teach him? Well, if you can't take one horn, you can't take the other horn, you go down the middle. He didn't say anything. I could not find one word that he said about this, either in print, in writing, in his editorials, nothing. Nothing. He played straight down the middle, and he even gave a speech later to that effect, no one can ever say that I ever said a word. A recent book has just been written called The Impeachment of Seltzer, uh, and it's very well done. And in it, the author says very little about Glenn, but he does say Glenn, during this whole situation, acted in a wise and responsible manner. He handled it with decorum. He came through it. And New York State woke up to find itself with an Irish Catholic governor. Now let us take a deep breath. People are realized the prejudice against blacks. They realize prejudice against Hispanics. They realize prejudice against Jewish people. They realize prejudice against various other people. People forget how much prejudice there were against Catholics, particularly Irish Catholics, not only because they were one of the first large group here of them, and not because they were the number, but they were highly visible. Right? And there was a lot of prejudice against Irish who were very devout, as you know. Right? They didn't like it, and we'll see in a minute. Martin H. Glenn was not happy. He said in a speech once, I was not the benefit of impeachment, I was a victim. His reputation was tarnished forever. And I said to myself, maybe this is why no one pays attention to him. Maybe this is why. His goal was to become the first Catholic governor, the president of the United States. That was his goal. And he knew that he was now tarnished because of this gigantic scandal of an impeachment of a governor, that that could not happen. Right? Now look again at Glenn as governor, 1913, 1914. First thing he did, he breaks with Tammany Hall. First thing, right off, man, like the horse out of the gate. He broke with Tammany Hall. He said, nope, I'm going to be my own man. The second thing, he brings peace to the system. Now people, they look at Gerald Ford. Well, what did he accomplish? Well, what he accomplished more than anything is he brought peace after uh, Nixon had resigned. He brought the government back to calmness, to a place where it could start doing the people's business, and Glenn did the same thing. He got direct election of senators put in, which was very critical at the time, a very progressive movement. He got direct primaries put in. He's the first governor ever nominated and won a primary in New York State. He did child and female labor law reforms to protect the workers. He put forth a constitutional convention which gave women the right to vote. It was later voted down, unfortunately. Okay. But his greatest achievement, and he felt the greatest achievement of his life, was workers' compensation. Now I'm going to read his own words. Here we go. Here's what Glenn said in his speech at Plattsburgh in 1914. I was raised in a locality, Valencia, New York, where many of my boyhood associates found employment in the nearby mills. The wheels of those mills had turned times without number since my departure. 
but I have never forgotten the times they stopped while the crippled forms of those who had been my friends and companions were carried from the factory doors. Some of the finest lads I knew and some of the prettiest girls were maimed and crippled in those factories. And I saw those who had no family or were too poor to carry helpless burdens go to the poorhouse because of the laws of New York gave them no adequate redress for the injuries they had suffered. And I made a vow that if power ever came to me, I would write a law which would give to every working boy and every working girl who was injured while at, while at work compensation for the wrong that injury had done them. So even as a young man, he said, something's got to be done for these working people. And that what he felt was his greatest achievement as governor. It's an amazing record. And again, I'm saying to myself, this guy should be a hero. What's going on? What's going on? And the puzzlement continues, right? Well, the election in 1914 was a tragedy for Glenn. He, he didn't do too good. Second, you know, first at bats, he was pretty good. Second at bats, he didn't do too, too good. Uh, Tammany Hall, well, he got the nomination. Tammany Hall decided, uh, Murphy said, oh, yeah, you're not going to be uh, part, of, part of the game. He says, uh, we're not turning out the votes. So the vote turnout in New York City for Glenn was very, very, very down for the Democratic Party, right? The progressives were mad at Glenn because they felt that he had uh, be betrayed them, you know, by not saying anything and supporting Sulzer, right? Sulzer got a little personal shot in on everybody, ran on a prohibition party. So the whole Democratic establishment was split three ways. And he lost. But the big thing out in the western part of the state, particularly among the Presbyterian ministers, they went out on campaigns, put them, in the, put them under, we don't want a Catholic. We don't want a Catholic this country. So between those four factors, he lost. And his personal papers, which I was fortunate enough to find, scribbled on the sidelines as, why can't a Catholic be governor? Why can't a Catholic be governor? Furious, rain scratched. Really bothered him. And Martin H. Glenn established a position, which was later adopted by John F. Kennedy and all others who ran for national office, is what? That a man's faith should not affect public policy. And he ran on that, and Kennedy and the other fellows that followed did the same thing. Right. Again, he goes back to the Times Union. Again in 1916, Woodrow Wilson asked him to give the keynote speech. Now Glenn at this time had became known as an orator. He was famous as an orator. He was famous as an editor. Right? So he's, man, here he is, got the whole National Convention of the Democrat Party again in St. Louis, and he gives a speech. The speech was a knockout. It, he kept us out of war, was the camp, was the speech, and as he used his slogan, World War I was raging, as he used his slogan, the audience just went, wow! And every time he said it, they chanted it back and forth. It became the campaign slogan for the camp, for, for Wilson. And they credit uh, Glenn with, uh, this slogan, which helped get uh, the president reelected, his position as an orator was well established. William Jennings Bryan, the great orator of America, cried during the speech. And Glenn was considered as good as him at the time. And that's amazing, I said. What's going on here? Glenn toured the country giving the speech. He kept us out of war. He gave that speech constantly. He even came to Felicia the day before the election and gave the speech in the Opera House. This man did not forget where he came from. In 1920, Glenn began his diplomacy to bring freedom and peace to Ireland. The Vatican reached out to him, don't forget, he was a national leader, he was a national Catholic leader, he was a national Irish American leader. He started a, Glenn started a shuttle diplomacy between the Irish rebels and the British government. The Valier, Collins, and Griffin, he talked to each one of them, he met with them, he got their position, he then met with Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and one of those personal things in politics where the people like each other really helps. Now, Lloyd George was not your typical Brit. He was a Welchman, and he was proud of being a Welchman, and that Celtic root kind of interacted very well. 
Glenn convinced him that there was no way the Irish American community was going to ever stop backing the Irish rebels. Ever. Money was being poured out from the Times Union workers. Money was going to be poured out through the whole of American Irish community to support these rebels. As the Irish were also gaining more power in politics and in government, the government position is going to change. It wasn't going to be a hands-off policy. Money was going to keep flowing. Political power was going to fall. Well, to Lloyd George's credit, he realized that. And the rebels and Lloyd George came together for the first time the rebels met with the British government, and these first negotiations led to 1922, the establishment of Ireland. Yeah, I, I was, as a teacher, I always had a secretary. <laughs> Here it goes. Lloyd George comes to Albany in 1923. He says, the people of Albany, Governor Glenn's fellow townsmen should feel highly honored because no man did more to bring a settlement of the Irish question. Listen to that. No man did more to bring a settlement to the Irish question and end the feud that existed for 700 years. And I am glad to be in your city to bear testimony to you of the great help he brought me. And on his death, he issued the statement, Mr. Glenn rendered a great, real service to the cause of Ireland, and he was a man of great ability and sincerity and depth of mind. When your enemy praises you, that's praise. When your enemy praises you, your support is supposed to praise you. When your enemy, wow. So I said, what's the answer here? You know, I think I answered the question why he's a hero, in my mind. Why is he forgotten? What's going on with him? How can this man, who was a great orator, a great editor, who was a, a, a diplomat, who was a congressman and held all these other offices, the first Roman Catholic governor, right? Did great progressive, great legislation. What happened? I could find no evidence of corruption. I could find no vices. I could find no women. I could find no scandal. I said, what's going on here? And I'm puzzling it out. I'm puzzling it out. Now, the second part, forgotten. Well, the answer came where it started, at St. Ignace Cemetery. One day I'm sitting in the kitchen at the house, and I'm thinking, something's going on. Let me check his death records to make sure I got, because the papers at the time of his death said he died of a heart attack. I said, okay. So I called a young lady up there, and I'm not going to say where her name is. I don't think she's there anymore. And I said, will you check the, the death, death uh, what they say in the cemetery records about him. He says, oh yeah, we have the cause of death right here in his records. She goes, oh my God. I said, what? He shot himself. I said, what? And I, I shook. I said, pardon me? I had her say it three times. I said, whoa. Wow. But I've got to be sure. Because records are records are records. So I went to the city of Albany. And they sent me the death certificate, and they assured enough. On December 14, 1924, Governor of Glenn, this good and gentle and kind man, he couldn't even hunt, which everybody and their brother in Columbia County used to do. <laughs> he could not. How come? What happened? What happened? So I answered the first part of the question. I said, this has got to be one of the reasons. Don't forget, suicide. You know, back in those days where people didn't understand psychological illnesses, big, major thing. So the next question is why? One question leads to another question. Like the Stoic says, everything, Stoic philosophy says everything is cause and effect. So, I'm reading Glenn's wife's obituary. I get to the obituary and it says her nephew, Woods McCall, the KO, resident of Loudonville, attended the funeral of the I said, geez, what if the guy could still be alive? That was 1940, right? It was 50 years later. I took the, the phone book. I opened the phone book. He's in the phone book. Nowadays, he wouldn't, right? So I call him up. 
He says, sure, come on up. And I go up there to Loudonville, and there he's in one of those houses in Loudonville. Okay, when I went to Siena for the first time, I went up for a job interview, and I saw those houses, and I couldn't believe people lived in houses like that. You know, come from the South End, right? I introduced myself, and I played it straight with him. Five minutes into the conversation, I said, I know why he died, how he died. He looks at me. See what I mean? I said, I know he shot himself. He practically fell off the couch. He said, I didn't find that out until I was 21. So I thought, why? And he went on to explain to me. Glenn had hurt his back at age approximately 16 when he slid into second base, they say, okay, the family. He suffered in pain daily for 40 years with a backache. Many of you have ever had back problems, and I have. Man, you get a backache, you can't sleep, you can't eat. It's the only thing worse maybe is a migraine. You can't, can't function. By the end of his life, Mr. McHale, who inherited all the money, by the way, <laughs> from the time he was in the family, uh, said that Glenn was being strapped every day by the female servants in a big iron device to hold him up and hold his back together. The pain was excruciating. My doctor, Dr. Bellagio, sent me a note about him after the book was published, last year actually, and he drew a little graph. And he thinks that the injury to the back, the way it was described, was to the lower back, down by the tail of the spine. Now Glenn went to spots, he went to doctors, he went to hospitals all over, he was operated on. He went to Europe to spots for medical treatment. For 40 years he could not get this pain to stop, daily, to the point where he could barely function, right? He goes to Boston in 24, some doctor operates on him, and bingo, the thing is a success. He's without pain for 40 years. Now you know if you've got a headache or a backache and it stops, oh, how good you feel, you know? He gets on the train to come home, again, right through Valencia, through Nairville, on the Boston Albany Railroad, and he comes all the way across home. He gets in his Willis Street house, 28 Willis Street, and the pain's back. I mean, here's a man who had been in pain for 40 years and it had stopped for a couple weeks before he got on the train and it's back. The pain is back. He went into this great depression. They called the priest from across the street where the chancery was. They came over. They called his doctors. They came over. They had him settled down. They left. The next morning was a Sunday morning. His wife goes to the cathedral. He's alone. In this horrendous night, he must have had despair and depression. Got the best of him. And he shot himself. And that was it. Before I left, the question was answered. Why he was a hero? The questions were answered. Why he was a hero? Why he was forgotten? Why he did what he did? Said. It was hushed up. The O'Connells had taken over the city. They, wasn't gonna, they were not going to let one of the leading Democrats and least leading citizens of Albany's name be besmirched. Again, just to say it again, the attitude towards suicide and the lack of knowledge about psychology at the time just wasn't there. It was, it was evident. They didn't, they didn't understand it. Right? And any of you who suffer from depression can understand it. Right? The Catholic Church covered it up. The first Roman Catholic governor. Right? You can't have a Catholic governor committing suicide. He technically could not even have been buried in St. Agnes Cemetery. I mean, he had a high mass with all kinds of priests. But as we were speaking earlier, uh, he probably got ex at the last moment. And they don't know when the soul left the body. That's, I think, to mystic philosophy, too, in there someplace. Especially if it was a Jesuit. <laughs> right? Say, right? Thirdly, the newspapers covered it up. It wasn't all the scandal journalism, journalism as it is now, mostly. But Billy Barnes and uh, Hearst, and, excuse me, and Glenn went at it constantly. Different so much in viewpoints of life and politics. But Barnes, they respected each other. It was a gentleman's disagreement, and Billy Barnes was not going to be spurched the man and hurt the will. He couldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. And it was covered up. Now, who knew? Well, 
The servants all knew. I found out later after the book was published. The children of the servants called me up and said, oh yeah, my mother told me this, so my grandmother told me. They knew. The staff knew. They kept it quiet. The older Irish Americans in Valencia knew. They kept it quiet. And actually, after the book was published, one of the most prominent ones stopped talking to me for about six years. Because he felt, even late, this late into the game, he had felt I'd besmirched the man. And I felt as a historian, I had, once I found it, I had to. I had. Somebody from Mackin and his fellow Irish American legislators came forward, and they had the second edition published. Right? One of the priests at Siena was kind enough to use it for a textbook for four or five years, which is something, I think. I was able to name the village square, which I put in in Galatia, across from the Glen School. I named it the Glen Square. I was able to establish a, a Celtic fest called the Governor Martin H. Glenn Celtic Fest. And for a small town like Galatia to pull out five, six hundred people. This, here I am, this little old Italian American guy running out. <laughs> <laughs> Spitballs at me or uh, falling asleep or throwing objects or starting to neck, you know, this was like, this thing happening my ninth grade classes. Would the you know, assemblyman Mac and Indy please come up and uh, and Jeff, would you please come up? Marianne, would you please come up? <coughs> oh, I know. He's afraid that this is all going to fall all over. This is my van. Governor Glenn's favorite picture of the man he admired more than anybody, shaking hands with William James Bryan. Oh, wow. I want to thank you for one, getting the second Bush edition published, and getting all the publicity and all the good things you've done for me. But I'd like to thank you, I think, for the greatest thing you did for me, and giving me the opportunity to be such wonderful Irish and Irish American people. And I consider me, your community has embraced me, and I embrace you back. So thank, thank you, you so much.